Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome back to our series on pharmacology. So in this video, we're going to talk about antibiotics. They're also called antibacterials, and they're used routinely to prevent and treat bacterial infections. So this is a tough uh, subject because there are just so many drug names to memorize. But as always, I will organize the information in a way that will help you remember it for the exam. So our first category is the sulfonamides. And sulfonamides are bacteriostatic, which means that they, um, they're used to treat bacterial infections by preventing bacterial growth. This word static, meaning to slow the growth of bacteria. Now there's a second mechanism that's called bactericidal. And that means that the antibiotic is being used to directly kill bacteria. So bacteriostatic and bactericidal are the two main um, ways that antibiotics are used. And I'll mention this concept again later because it's an important concept that bactericidal and bacteriostatic drugs cancel each other out and should never be mixed together. So sulfonamides, bacteriostatic, and their specific mechanism which is probably even more important to know, is that it's a folate synthesis inhibitor. And it competes with PABA, which is para-aminobenzoic acid. But the important thing here is that it causes a, folate, a folic acid or folate dis deficiency, and therefore impacts the DNA of the bacteria. Now some examples are sulfadiazine and sulfamethoxazole, Notice the sulfa prefix is common throughout all the sulfonamides, and they're also conveniently called sulfa drugs. So if you see that prefix, think sulfonamide, think folate synthesis inhibitor. All right, next, we have the fluoroquinolones, and these, in contrast, are bactericidal. Like we said, they kill rapidly growing bacteria. And Again, knowing their specific mechanism of action, what they do to either slow or kill bacteria is much more important on the exam than just knowing if they're cytal or static. So the fluoroquinolones are DNA synthesis inhibitors, whereas the sulfonamides sort of indirectly impacted DNA by inhibiting folate synthesis, the fluoroquinolones directly inhibit the synthesis of DNA itself. Now for this one, ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin are some examples, and notice that the suffix here is the same. So this floxacin, if you see that, then you know it's a fluoroquinolone. All right, so this one is probably one of the most important slides I'll have in this video. And that's because penicillins are one of the most commonly, if not the most commonly prescribed antibiotic, and will definitely appear in some form on the board exam. So penicillins are bactericidal, and their specific mechanism of action is that they inhibit the synthesis of the cell wall. And they're a beta-lactam beta antibiotic, and this is a class of broad-spectrum antibiotics, which means they target a wide range of bacteria from gram-positive through gram-negative, and the penicillins contain um, a beta-lactam ring in their molecular structure, and as do all beta-lactam antibiotics, and that's how they're categorized. And in red here is that beta-lactam ring that we'll see in the next couple of drugs we talk about. The penicillins are cross-allergenic with cephalosporins, which means if you're allergic to penicillin, there's a chance you're also allergic to cephalosporin, which is the next category we'll talk about. And that's because they're chemically related. Now the cephalosporins are also beta-lactam antibiotics and they share this same structure. Okay, so now for some specifics. We have penicillin G, which is administered IV. That means intravascularly, so you'd have to start an IV and inject it into the patient. 
and it's and it's administered IV because it's more sensitive to acid degradation. So penicillin G, if you were to take it orally, would be rapidly broken down by the stomach acids, and so it has to be taken IV. Whereas penicillin V is actually taken orally, and because it's a less sensitive to acid degradation. So this is a critical um, fact here, and unfortunately the V doesn't correlate with IV, and actually the G version is the one you take IV, and the V version is the one you take orally. So that's a really important fact, and you can actually just get tested on that fact um, specifically. All right, so another penicillin is amoxicillin, a really commonly prescribed one, and this is broad spectrum. So again, it covers a wide range of, of um, bacteria. Next we have Augmentin, which is combined amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. And the clavulanic acid is beta-lactamase resistant. And so what does this mean? Well, basically there's an ongoing war between bacteria and antibiotics. So you have a bacteria and then you find an antibiotic that works against that bacteria by either um, killing it outright or just slowing its growth. Now, some of those bacteria fight back and they become resistant to certain antibiotics. An example of this would be an, uh, an, a bacterium that has this beta-lactamase enzyme. And so beta-lactamase can break down the beta-lactam ring of the antibiotic, rendering it useless. So if you have a, a bacterium with beta-lactamase, it's going to be resistant to these um, more simple forms of penicillin. But adding in this element of clavulanic acid makes the antibiotic more effective against these antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So it's a good thing to have in our arsenal. So Augmentin is one of them, and we also have Methicillin for when bacteria produce this beta-lactamase enzyme. And we also have Dicloxacillin as another example. Next we have Ampicillin, which is the, has the best and broadest gram-negative spectrum. So if you see a question that's asking about an antibiotic that's uh, specifically effective against gram-negative bacteria, ampicillin should jump into your mind. And lastly, we have carbenicillin, which is used specifically against the Pseudomonas bacteria. So that's just another high-yield fact to remember about that specific penicillin. And notice that all of them, with the exception of Augmentin, have this psyllin suffix. And so that helpfully reminds us that it's in the penicillin category. Okay, like I said before, our next one we're going to talk about is cephalosporins. They're also bactericidal, they're also cell wall synthesis inhibitors, and thus also beta-lactam antibiotics. I listed out um, some examples of these different generations. Basically, the cephalosporins have evolved with time, and we have first through fifth generation cephalosporins. So you could, you know, sit down and memorize each of these. Probably not that important, um, more low yield than the other facts that I'm mentioning, but um, I'll just mention this tri is a nice way to remember tri meaning three for third generation so there's some things you can use to help you remember these, but probably not the most important fact here. So next we have monobactams, which are bactericidal. And so these are also cell wall synthesis inhibitors and also beta-lactams. And so an example is as trionam, and it has this suffix am, which correlates with the am of monobactam. And I forgot to mention this in the last slide, but you probably noticed that all of these begin with this ceph prefix. So that lines up with the prefix 
cephalosporin. So you'll notice I'm pointing out a lot of these like prefixes and suffixes because a lot of these names are difficult to memorize, but if you can at least remember you know, the prefixes and suffixes of these names, you can be able to quickly think, okay, that's the category that that drug is in. And another example are the carbapenems. They're also bactericidal, beta-lactams, and imipenem is an example with this N-E-M suffix lining up with the carbapenems. So again, a nice, helpful way to remember these. And so the last four we talked about, penicillins, cephalosporins, monobactams, and the carbapenems are all beta-lactam antibiotics, and they all share that beta-lactam molecular structure. Now we have the tetracyclines, and these are a really important class of antibiotic. They're bacteriostatic, and they're protein synthesis inhibitors. And specifically, they um, attack the 30S ribosomal subunit of the ribosome, which is responsible for making proteins. So some examples are tetracycline, that's an actual name of a drug and also the name of the category it's in, doxycycline, and minocycline. So they all have this cycline or cycline suffix. And out of all the antibiotics we're going to talk about, this category has the broadest antimicrobial spectrum. So that's another pretty critical fact to remember in this whole video. So tetracyclines have the broadest antimicrobial spectrum. Next we have the macrolides. And I promise we're almost done with these categories. And I have some kind of funny tips to help you remember these next two. So the macrolides are bacteriostatic and they're protein synthesis inhibitors, just like the tetracyclines, except they attack the 50S ribosomal subunit. So some examples are erythromycin, clarithromycin, and azithromycin. And they all have this suffix thromycin. So I have a way to remember this. I remember the phrase, Mac likes to throw mice. And that correlates with the name Mac lides to throw mice. And so this is Little Mac, he's a video game character, and I picture him throwing a mice, or throwing a mouse. So that helps me remember Mac likes to throw mice. Now next we have the lincosamides. They're also bacteriostatic, and they're also protein, protein synthesis inhibitors that attack the 50S ribosomal subunit. So very similar to the last category. And similarly, they have this mycin suffix without the throwing part. So how do I remember this one? I remember the phrase link also hides mice. So I line that up with the name, Link also hides mice. And so Link is another video game character, and he likes to hide the mice, so Mac doesn't throw them. So I know it's kind of silly, but I do remember this, and it helps me pick out these drug names and categories. All right, so that's it for the drug categories. Now let's talk about some applications. So when is antibiotic prophylaxis required? And so this means taking antibiotics before dental treatment to avoid systemic infections. So according to the American Heart Association, these cardiovascular conditions require antibiotic prophylaxis prior to dental treatment. And these four are absolutely critical to remember because I guarantee you'll get at least one or two questions on this information alone. So the cardiovascular conditions that need antibiotics would be if you have a prosthetic heart valve, if you have a history of an endocarditis, which is a type of heart infection, a heart transplant with valvulopathy, which means some sort of dysfunction with your heart valves, or if you have congenital heart problems. So these four 
would be mentioned in a case question, and you'd have to know if that patient requires antibiotics. Now another example would be if the patient has a compromised immune system. So if they, had, they underwent an organ transplant, were taking some immunosuppressive drugs, if they had some neutropenia, a very, very low count of neutrophils, or if they're undergoing cancer therapy, and as part of that therapy, taking immunosuppressive drugs, they would need antibiotics to prevent an infection. So that makes, um, that makes sense because if they have less of an immune system response, they're more apt to get an infection after dental treatment. But this also depends on the type of dental procedure being performed. So dental procedures that require antibiotics and a patient that had one of these conditions would be like if they had undergoing extractions or periodontal surgery or an implant surgery, just basically things that will be invasive and cause a lot of bleeding. So whether or not antibiotics should be taken prior to treatment is really a group effort from the general physician and the dentist. So when is it required? If a patient has one of these conditions and is undergoing a dental treatment, that would be invasive and provoke bleeding. So how about a prescription for infective endocarditis prophylaxis? So if we're giving, uh, or if we're giving treatment to a patient that needs antibiotics, what would that script look like? So our first choice, our first choice for antibiotic prophylaxis is amoxicillin. And amoxicillin would be a two gram dose and be taken one hour prior to dental treatment. Now for children, our first choice again is still amoxicillin, but this time it's weighted based on the patient's weight, as a lot of things in pediatric dentistry are. So it's 50 milligrams per kilogram of patient weight, and again, taken one hour before treatment. Now what if that patient has a penicillin allergy? So remember, amoxicillin is one of those penicillin drugs we talked about. Our second choice is clindamycin. And so clindamycin, link also hides mice, that's a lincosamide, and you take 600 milligrams. So different uh, dose for a different drug. And this you'd also take one hour before dental treatment. Now what if it's a child? So same thing, take clindamycin, but again, you weight it based on the patient weight, and it's taken one hour before treatment. All right, so what if oral medications are not an option? So if you're taking a non-oral antibiotic, take an IV intravascularly or IM intramuscularly, you would take ampicillin. Now it's the same as amoxicillin, it's two grams, but this time, since it's absorbed quicker, only take it 30 minutes before dental treatment. And for children, if you're taking it non-orally, same thing, ampicillin, 50 milligrams per kilogram. Note the consistency and dosage between the amoxicillins and the ampicillins. And again, it's taken 30 minutes before dental treatment, less time because it's taken IV or IM. So those are the six most common um, numbers and, and lists of drugs that you'd have to remember for a given patient case. And nice and easy, if you're doing prosthetic joint prophylaxis and having a patient, your first choice would be Keflex, which is that first generation cephalosporin, two grams, one hour before dental treatment. So now in real life, amoxicillin and other antibiotics we talked about can be recommended by the orthopedic surgeon or the general physician. It depends on the doctor, honestly, but for the boards, Keflex is your answer for prosthetic joint prophylaxis. And again, according to the ADA, the American Dental Association, it's most appropriate that the orthopedic surgeon recommend the appropriate antibiotic regimen and when reasonable, the actual prescription. 
So the board exam loves to throw these in the case section. So I promise you'll probably see one of these word for word. When is antibiotic prophylaxis not recommended? So this is pretty tricky. Also, cardiovascular conditions. Cardiac pacemaker does not need antibiotic prophylaxis. Rheumatic fever without valvular dysfunction does not need it. Mitral valve prolapse without valvular regurgitation does not need it. Now, if this said with valvular dysfunction, remember that was one of our four things that needs it, then you would have to do antibiotic prophylaxis. So it's really easy to get really absorbed in a case. You're looking over the patient's health history and you see this thing, mitral valve prolapse without valvular regurgitation, and it sounds really intense. And you're, you're thinking, well, that pr probably means they need some sort of antibiotics but they don't. It's only those four things we talked about. So that's definitely a tricky, tricky thing that they like to ask. So um, definitely remember those. And also um, certain dental procedures like simple restorative, uh, simple root canal therapy, and making impressions won't require antibiotics because they're not invasive procedures. All right, so this is another pretty important slide. Probably you may get at least one, maybe two questions on side effects of antibiotics. So what causes GI um, an upset gastrointestinal system and this pseudomonas colitis would be clindamycin. So it could be, this could be straight from the board exam like a question and just asks you which of these drugs would cause this side effect. So that's an example of one. What is most likely to cause a super infection? Be a broad spectrum antibiotic. Super infection meaning the antibiotics clear out a lot of the helpful bacteria because not all bacteria are bad. You have some um, normal oral flora, which are bacteria that are helpful in the mouth. And so if you take antibiotics that are really broad spectrum and killing all bacteria, both good and bad, now you're more likely to get, um, to get attacked by some really bad bacteria and you have no good bacteria to help you out. So that would be an example of a super infection. Now what's associated with aplastic anemia? That's this, this drug called chloramphenicol associated with liver damage is tetracycline, and associated with allergic cholestatic hepatitis is erythromycin. So these are just five kind of high yield facts. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have a great way to remember some of these, but if you have some time to learn these, that could be pretty helpful for you. All right, and then we also have some drug interactions. So not all drugs like to be taken at the same time. And so try not to get too overwhelmed with this slide. I know it's a lot of information and you probably won't get asked about quite honestly anything on this slide, but these are some common drug interactions with antibiotics and are nice to know. So for this, I have the antibiotic listed first and then the drug it interacts with second. So, and actually the most important concept here is the first one. And I talked about this way back when we started the video, that bactericidal and bacteriostatic drugs cancel each other out. And so how does this actually work? Well, if you're curious, the bactericidal drugs kill bacteria in their most vulnerable stage, which is when they are rapidly growing. That's actually when they're easiest to kill. So if you're taking a bacteriostatic drug, that's slowing the growth of the bacteria, which is actually making it more defensive against a bactericidal drug, which relies on the bacteria rapidly and rapidly producing. So taking both of them together is actually not a great thing and lowers the effectiveness of each other. So combination therapy, where you take two or more drugs, they should be both bactericidal or they should both be bacteriostatic. Now some other specific examples, 
penicillin interacts poorly with probenicid, which is a uric acid reducer for gouty arthritis, and probenicid alters the renal clearance of penicillin. Now, tetracycline effectiveness is reduced by concurrent ingestion of antacids like Tums or dairy products like milk. And that's because tetracycline is a chelation agent, which means it binds calcium and other ions. So in the instructions, if you got a bottle of tetracycline, it would say, do not take with milk or other dairy products because it severely reduces its absorption and limits its effectiveness by this chelation or binding with the calcium ions in the milk. Um, broad spectrum antibiotics interact poorly with anticoagulants. So they actually enhance the action of Coumarin anticoagulants because they reduce vitamin K sources. Now, antibiotics in general, like you know, ampicillin, other ones we mentioned, decreases the effectiveness of oral contraceptives due to suppression of normal GI flora and it's involved in recycling of active steroids. And lastly, macrolides such as erythromycin, remember um, the MAC likes to throw mice, inhibits the metabolism of drugs such as seldane, which is an antihistamine, and digoxin, or digoxin, which is an antiarrhythmic. Now, there's this quick concept of drug concert concentration. Basically, clindamycin concentrates really well in bone. Tetracycline concentrates really well in gingival curricular fluid. So that can maybe net you uh, one question on the board exam. Just a nice, quick, easy thing to re remember. And that explains why tetracycline is often used in, um, period in the periodontal world, because um, that antibiotic concentrates really well in the fluid that bathes the gingival sulcus. All right, and lastly, there are more and more questions that seem to be coming up on the Part 2 board exam on these medications, on antivirals and antifungals, so I briefly wanted to mention them. So acyclovir and valcyclovir are antivirals, and note this um, common suffix, the vir specifically, and they're used to combat a herpes infection, which of course is a virus. And now the other one, fluconazole and ketoconazole, and note this azole um, suffix, is used to treat um, fungal infections. So these are antifungals, and they're used against candidiasis, which is probably the most common fungal infection in the mouth. And now I got this fact tested specifically when I t took the board exam, so I definitely recommend knowing this random fact um, pretty well. So clotrimazole, which is an antifungal, or mycelex, which is the name brand, is found in a troche form, or a troche form. And this is basically a lozenge that um, dissolves in your mouth, and it could look like a lifesaver or a circular flat tablet. But for whatever reason, you should know that Mycelex is the antifungal that is found in a troche form. All right, so I apologize. I know it was a long video and a lot of information, but hopefully I was able to organize it in a way that helps you remember it. So thanks so much for watching, guys. If you like this video, please leave a like so I know and subscribe to my channel for more on dental pharmacology and all things dentistry. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll see you all in the next video.